Hey guys, we're reading through The Art of Neighboring by Jay Pethak and Dave Runyon. There's what it looks like. And we are, we're on chapter one. And chapter one is entitled, Who is My Neighbor? So if you know uh, the Great Commandment, it's in uh, Matthew 22. Matthew 22 verses 37 to 40 says, says this. And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. In other words, all of the Old Testament, all of Scripture, flows out of loving God and loving our neighbor. And we know that we ought to love our neighbor, Jesus says here, as yourself, as you already care a lot about yourself. That's the way in which we ought to care for others. But many have debated what it means, what Jesus means here by your neighbor. And it's been easy for us to say, well, that's everybody's my neighbor. As a way of saying, I don't need to treat anybody like a neighbor. So the authors pose the question, what if he meant our actual neighbors? Do you know their names? It's amazing how much the news is filled with scary stories of serial killers and kidnappers. And we're tempted to think that pretty much everybody that lives around us is like that. And so therefore we create excuses and filled with fears of, of people and the unknown and we're hindered from actually loving them and, and getting to know them. If there are things in your neighborhood that need work as you look around it, uh, don't just sit around. Maybe stand up and begin to address them. Maybe you should look around. Look around your neighborhood. And maybe right now, uh, think about your neighborhood. Think about your dorm, your apartment complex, the people who live around you. Now, it may be easy to feel overwhelmed by the things that you notice. Things like the neighbor over there whose grass is always way too tall, like he's trying to build a jungle. Or the loud neighbors uh, with the teens in there with their music way too loud blaring out their window. Or the invisible neighbors, the ones that you see kind of pull in to the garage and, and they're out in the morning and, and you know somebody lives there. You just have never seen them. Or, or the ones that are uh, super busy families that, that you've never been able to meet, but you always see them in and out. Um, what if we got to know them? What if we got to know the people who live around us? That we'd be surprised that they're normal people who want to belong and who want to achieve dreams and goals in their lives, just like we do. Now, the authors tell a story that happened in the city of Denver with a bunch of churches that came together wanting to figure out ways that they could serve the city. So they asked the mayor to come and they asked the mayor this question. And so he gave them a, a list of, of things that they could volunteer for and help out with, like a soup kitchen or a homeless shelter or, you know, things like that, after school programs. Gave them a nice list. And, but then he said that most of this stuff would just be fixed if we could just learn how to be great neighbors. And he mentioned that relationships are better, after all, than programs. Because they're organic and they're ongoing. And in effect, he was actually saying that it would be great if Christians could begin to live out the great commandment. That's what he was saying without actually saying it. And so the pastors noticed this. And they, they met up with... Um, another lady who was good at this idea of neighboring, and they began to ask her what this looks like. And she pointed out that there was no noticeable difference between Christians and non-Christians when it came to neighboring. So what would it look like if all of our churches, they said, were to join together as a neighboring movement? What if Christians got together in their neighborhoods to throw block parties? Because Jesus is right, they realized. Being a neighbor really does matter. We have the ability by the Holy Spirit to be 
great neighbors. The great commandment to love your neighbor then is not just a cliche. Do we want a cool, do we want to be just a cool young church that thrives because it's cool and young crossroads? Or do we want deep transformation in our communities as a result of the impact of the gospel by the Spirit through His people? This is the way it works. As people transformed by the gospel live out the great commandment, we wouldn't be surprised that transformation comes to communities as a result. In John 17, Jesus is going to the cross and he prays. And John 17 recounts his prayer, what's called the high priestly prayer of Jesus. He prays for himself, his disciples, and for all the believers. And it's interesting that he prays specifically for the unity of believers as they are sent into the world. We're to love God, love others, especially our actual neighbors, and everything else flows out of that. When we become good neighbors, we become who we were made to be. And the result is that our communities become the places that they were made by God to be. Relationships take time. But the Holy Spirit has always moved in and through relationships as his people cultivate them. So let's get outside, literally, and be great neighbors together in our city.